Uh, well, good evening. I'm uh, grateful to be with you. It's funny that Dave said I had seven or eight kids, because that's what I say usually. That's my <laughs> wife. <laughs> my wife and I have seven biological, but you know, if you have a big family, you know that you just there's always hangers on. <laughs> an extra, what's an extra mouth at the dinner table at that night? So we actually do have a few others that call us mom and dad. Uh, it's kind of a natural thing to happen. Um, let me, if you don't mind, let me just open us up to the Father, thank you for uh, this place and this evening for us to gather together. Um, we do so in the name of Jesus um, and around this, this uh, amazing thing uh, that you have blessed to develop in our midst called Safe Families. And we just ask that you be with us. Uh, you would help us to think carefully through uh, the joy and the pain of being involved um, uh, in this way and with these families. And I do pray it would be to your glory and to our benefit, to the benefit of the children and the parents uh, that we have the privilege of interacting with. And uh, so, Father, uh, honor this time, be present with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Dave is right in saying that one of the things that I uh, have a lot of uh, passion about is in thinking about the topic, um, it's of sort of the poor, broadly speaking, of the church. Um, I am utterly convinced that uh, the church in America is in a really, really bad position. Because they're not, we are not, uh, very often uh, poised to be obedient to Jesus when he said, you will always have the poor among you. So he said that as a statement that was very presumptive. The presumption is that we as Christians will in fact always have the poor among us. They will be part of us, part of our churches, part of our friends, part of our family network. But in America, because of the way that the suburban communities have developed, the way that our economy has developed, honestly most of us can live our entire lives with virtually no personal connection to the poor. And we are at a huge spiritual growth disadvantage if that's the way that we live. So it's, I'm just convinced it's bad for us. Uh, it's that part of the structure of our economy and our society that we live in. And hence, I love Safe Families, because it absolutely is a phenomenal way to intentionally interrupt that pattern, painfully so at times. Um, and, and so I just, I'm very excited about that. Um, I do, we, we host about, um, uh, five, six hundred kids a year, typically for a week at a time. Some, they're all missions teams, right? So sometimes they're high school kids with adults, and during spring break, it's almost all college students. And we operate this program called Bridge Builders out of the assumption that um, engaging in ministry in the city <coughs> ought to be reciprocally beneficial. So we think very carefully about what's well, actually really good for these students who are coming in from the suburbs about spending a week in our neighborhood. What do they need that our, that our neighborhood has to offer? Um, we kind of know what our neighborhood needs that they have to offer, you know, that's not that hard to spot. But it's, but the flip side of that is inherently true. Um, and, and so that's, that's definitely like my approach to thinking about this general topic about safe families. And so um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about what it means to engage um, low income families uh, in the way that, that typically happens in the context of safe families experience. Um, in 2004, after being the director at Sunshine for five years and not living in the city, um, I said to my wife, uh, hey, I have a crazy idea. <laughs> um, uh, how about if we move into the city? Um, and not not like, you know, Lincoln Park or something like that where we had lived formerly, but uh, Woodlawn, a 98% African American neighborhood that's at the lowest rung of poverty rates, so the highest rates of poverty in the city more at the time more than 40% of the, of the residents lived below the poverty line, which is the lowest category there is for measuring neighborhoods sociologically. Um, and it, had, it was born of uh, a process of being influenced by a number of Christian ministry leaders around the country, some very famously here in Chicago, like Wayne Gordon in Lawndale and Glenn K. Ryan. Uh, in Austin, who had done this 30 years ago. 30 years ago, those guys moved into those neighborhoods. And uh, we had been working in Cabrini. And the luxury of working with inner city kids in Cabrini is you couldn't live there. 
<laughs> so you drive in and you do your ministry and then you go home. And um, uh, it's more, I don't know, stable for the family, but from a ministry standpoint, it really lacks. It, 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 it has some shortcomings. So I said to Paula, uh, after feeling like the Lord had really been directing our steps for a while, <clears throat> I think it's time for us to move into the community. We were, they were tearing down Cabrini, so we were relocating our ministry from Cabrini into Woodlawn, and I just said it's, it's time for us to move in. So we moved into the neighborhood in 2004. Uh, we had our uh, fifth, uh, sixth child born just as we moved in, um, and uh, and one more couple, uh, a couple years later. So my uh, eight, nine, and ten year olds are running around here. They're actually on the other side right there, but. So those are, those are the kids for me that were born as, essentially as we moved into the community, and so they've known really nothing else in terms of their growing up. Uh, and then we have four others. My 15-year-old daughter's here, and then I have boys that are 18, 19, and, or 19, 20, and 21 uh, that have moved out. And so it's been a very in, um, experiential learning process for me. I live in the neighborhood, I run a ministry, because we have a big family, it's meant that we've had multiple other single moms with their kids, uh, high school kids, others that have just sort of begun to call our uh, our family their home, and, uh, and we've learned through that. And I'm also kind of a reader, and one of the one of the things that happened to me when I first went into Cabrini was I looked around and said, "What happened? Like this is clearly not the way it was supposed to be." And it and it and it started a process of reading and learning that then continued when I moved into Woodlawn and, and basically had the same question. Many of our inner city neighbors in the city of Chicago, if you look around, you can tell that they were once magnificent communities. You, know, you drive down Garfield Boulevard, which is totally the hood right now, but the gray stones and the architecture on Garfield Boulevard are magnificent, better than much of what you see on the Gold Coast. I mean, it's just amazing stuff. So you know there's a history there, and I started digging into it. And I started digging into the history of the community and also just understanding who was living there now, how they would come to think. So I want to basically share a handful of, uh, of things that relate to that. Um, and so I'll work off uh, just an outline of some principles. And, and, and the first thing that I would just tell you about uh, that's very predictable about your experience in being involved with, say, families is that you will not be understood by them. Uh, this is a cultural thing. With one of the single moms that, that uh, moved into our home, you know, I'll never forget, I, I, she had moved in, her daughter moved in, they really clicked with our family. Like, it was the, by far the easiest sort of situation like this we'd ever had. And um, she, I think she'd been living there maybe a week or something, and I came into our home, and, and um, the, she was standing at the, at the kitchen counter washing dishes, and, and, um, and I just said, you know, I just want to tell you that it's really a blessing for you to be on our own. And we're grateful for you, and we're grateful for your daughter, and, um, and we just want you to know that, that um, we appreciate you. And, um, and she gave me this weird, like, cold shoulders response that didn't actually really say anything to me, and I just thought, okay, maybe that was an awkward moment or something. And so I left. And three days later, I found out from my wife that she had gone to my wife and said, um, Joel wants me to move out, um, and I'm trying to do it by the end of the week. <laughs> I mean, it, it just could not have been more polar opposite, you know, in terms of what I said versus what she heard. And I still, to this day, don't know how it is that she understood <laughs> my words of affirmation as actually meaning, you need to move out. <laughs> complete disconnect and that happens again and again and, um, and and then the other thing that's predictable is not only will you not be understood but but there will be so many times when you won't understand what's happening we have this funny story from one of our first sit downs with a safe family and uh, they were great and they had really fallen in love with this mom and really gotten involved with a couple of her well got involved with the kids on multiple occasions this had led them to get to know the mother better and so at one point eventually they visited her home in a neighborhood that's not very far from where I live and they got there and there wasn't a stitch of furniture in the place kids were sleeping on the floor they were sitting on the floor there's just nothing there and so they thought beautifully hey this is something we could help with like this is not a big deal and so they pulled together some friends and I don't know if they went to the thrift store or if they went to the regular furniture store but whatever they did they furnished her apartment for they were very excited about it. It was great. Um, and, and 
and then she moved about three months later. And she didn't take any furniture with her. <laughs> so they find out afterwards, of course, that she's moved. And they're like, well, what about the furniture, right? Like, what happened? Well, there's just this total disconnect, right? Like, this is just a repeated thing that happens. It's not only do you express yourself often in these contexts in such clear terms, and you're not understood, but you see something that's happening, uh, even like the shoes thing, and it's like, uh, I have no category for that. I have no way to know how you would possibly do that. I don't have those problems, because I don't make those decisions, right? I don't think like that. So the reality is that, that we, uh, when, when you grow up in poverty, you think very, very differently. And this is incredibly important to understand, and I'll only be able to unpack a little bit of this for you this evening. But you have to recognize this, that you think differently than the average mom that you're gonna interact with in a safe family context. Um, and I'll just jot down a, a, a few of them. Um, while you can't understand how they think, um, what I hope to do is to help you understand why they would think differently, okay? And a little bit of the outline of how that works and I think that that can be helpful then in understanding specific things. So the first thing to understand about anybody's life that you look at um, is that um, like, uh, oh, that looks like a top hat. It's not a top hat. That's an iceberg. <laughs> How's that? Um, that? That when you meet someone, you are exposed to their culture. And there's a, there's a certain amount, and it's actually a rather small amount, that's visible to you about their culture. And the culture shows up in things like lifestyle and communication and, and decision making. And you see those, and those are the external manifestation of a culture. But the reality is that most Everything that that is built on is this large foundation that's sort of beneath the water, which you cannot see. And it's very hard uh, to recognize that and to understand that. But what's below the value, but below the, the water surface, um, is values and beliefs and experiences. And, and those are the things that you do not have generally speaking, in common. Certainly the last one, certainly the experiences. And so it's important to recognize that the way that you function, the way the lifestyle that you have, and the decisions that you make, and the way that you communicate with people are directly attributable to your cultural underpinnings, right? Like what you believe, and what you have experienced, and what you value, and what you've been taught to value through the history of your life, that all forms who we are on the outside. When you grow up in poverty, some of these things are very, very different. And there's a, the, the, the good word to put to this that's helpful is, is this. Um, we can just call them uh, hidden rules. Because all cultures have a set of unwritten or hidden rules. Every culture has it. And there's, so there's a real distinct difference between uh, the, the rules of people in poverty and not in poverty. But really there's another sort of set of distinctions that you could say broadly speaking, and that's between people who would think of themselves as middle class and people who think of themselves as very wealthy. There are different ways to think of things. Your timeline for decision making, if you're in the middle class, tends to be sort of you're thinking about sort of the span of your lifetime. And you make decisions thinking ahead, you're thinking about your kids going to college, uh, possibly when they get married, maybe even a little bit about when they have kids. If you're really wealthy, you tend to think in terms of legacy. You tend to think about generations future, right? Like what is the track record that I will leave? So it's a very different, you can sort of recognize that among, you know, somebody who has a billion dollars is thinking very differently about the timeline of their life and they're making decisions along those lines as well. It would be irrelevant for us to think five generations out, right? Like, who would do that, right? If I had a billion dollars, that would influence me to think very, very differently. But if you're poor, you, in that same way, are not thinking in that kind of a time frame that you and I are, 
where you're thinking about your kids and their college and maybe their kids. You're thinking about today and this week. And that has a huge influence in terms of how you make decisions. Um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this fascinating book called Outliers. And in chapter four of that book, if you have not read it, I highly recommend this book. In chapter four of the book, he tells this really, really interesting story about two geniuses. One named Chris Landcamp and another one named Robert Oppenheimer. And Chris Landcamp is a is is clearly a, a you know one of the smartest guys on the planet, but he's born into a highly dysfunctional, very poor family. There are four children in the family. They all have different fathers, none of whom live with them. Um, it's very unstable. As I read the story, while it's set in Montana, it, it just feels a lot like our neighborhood in different ways. Um, Robert Oppenheimer, on the other hand, is born into a very affluent city uh, uh, family in New York City. And as, as the chapter unfolds, he, he tells the story, and, and basically what happens is that Chris Landcamp never even graduates from college. And he's actually still alive, and Gladwell interviews him, and it's really kind of a fascinating story. But he never effectively accomplishes anything. Conversely, Robert Oppenheimer, while he's in grad school, literally tries to murder one of his graduate school assistants. He tries to poison him, and they find the poison before the guy dies, so he doesn't actually succeed in this you know, plot that he had in mind. Robert Oppenheimer goes on to lead the Manhattan Project for the United States, to develop the atomic bomb. And what, what Gladwell ends up talking about is the role of entitlement that is ingrained into families that are middle class and wealthy. He's, and he tells it in these fascinating little stories. But, you know, on the way to the doctor, what do you tell your kids? Well, we're going to ask the doctor this. We're going to ask the dentist this. And yeah, go ahead and ask them that question. I'm sure you should ask them that question. You should do this and you should do that. When you're born into a poor family, you are never given that sort of healthy sense of entitlement. You never learn to ask the right question. You never learn to ask the appropriate question and the next question. And you never learn when to stop. So what happens is you take a poor kid, as we did this summer, we hired 25 teenagers. For the, it was for almost all of them, it was the first paid job they'd ever had. We took them downtown. Well, they worked for us in the neighborhood all summer, and then we did these like uh, business exposure trips where we took them to different uh, offices, corporate settings, had them interview. We were just trying to expand their horizon for what they can see. And what would happen is we would set them in a private equity boardroom where they would have the opportunity to meet really, really successful, you know, Christian people and ask really good questions and, like, be fascinated, you know, and me and the staff are totally fascinated, you know. <laughs> and the kids, like, don't ask a single question through the whole thing. It's just, this happened again and again and again. It really didn't matter how much we primed them. They didn't ask questions. They didn't know what questions to ask. And then they'd say something like, how do I get a job here and how much money do you make? So, so it, just, it just illustrates in such powerful ways in which all of that little ingrained coaching about the right question and the next question and the appropriate question that probably all of us basically grew up with. By the way, this is not a racial issue. This is essentially an economic issue. I've had this conversation with friends of mine who are white who grew up in poverty. And I, they don't even have to tell me. I, I know this about them. Because I see. Because I, I'm... My relationship with them is often about helping them to think carefully through something and know what are the right questions to ask. Well, ask this question too. Ask this question too. And so this, this unwritten rule about appropriate question uh, to me is absolutely fascinating. Uh, and, I, and, I, and that book, Gladwell does a, a great job just in that one chapter of talking about it. So a couple of other very specific things that come out of this sort of idea of what, ha what is happening uh, uh, under sort of the surface and, and behind the scenes with kids who grow up in poverty versus the middle class is that when you grow up in the middle class, you're taught to think and to communicate in a linear fashion. So if we tell a story, we start with the beginning of the story, and we move to the next part of the story, and the next part of the story, and then maybe the most, uh, I don't know, entertaining part of the story in order, and then we come to the conclusion of the story. It's the way that we're taught to tell stories. Um, it's, it's the narrative of how we grow up. We get that when people are reading Little Red Riding Hood to, to us, when we're little kids, Anna. When you grow up in poverty, you tend to think, not linearly, but casually. You tend to think in a very uh, different way. And, and the, what generally happens is that you highlight 
the most entertaining part of the story first. So if you hear someone who's grown up in poverty tell the story, the first thing that is going to come out of the story is the most dramatic part of the story, right? And she put the slipper on her foot and it fit. Wait a minute. How did we get there? Who, who, what slipper? Who are we talking about? Right? And then if, when you're talking to somebody, and I know that you recognize this, you're communicating with your, you're like, you're like, wait a minute. How did this happen? How did you get here? And you'll get this detail and that detail and this detail. But what you will not get is we started here, we moved there, we had this problem with the neighbor. That problem with the neighbor actually escalated a little bit, and then it led to this, and then, like, you don't get stories that way. Because you don't think that way, because you don't communicate that way. And so that, this is a huge difference, the way that we communicate and the way that we think, in a linear versus a casual way. You and I are programmed to the core to think A, B, C, D, E, and we think that's right. Right? We think that's the only proper way to tell a story. It's actually just the only way that you and I understand the story. It's not necessarily the right way to tell the story. And so seeing that, like, it's normal to us, and then we take the step and assume that that's then the right way to tell it. It's not necessarily the right way. It's probably not the way that most people on the face of the earth actually communicate. If we read right to left, there's a whole lot of people in the world that read left or right. So just recognizing that, just recognizing that we have this pattern, and, and whenever we're talking to a mom, or we're talking to a family, we're, we have to, naturally, we're just trying to get the story straight. Now there are some real advantages to thinking in a linear fashion. And one of them is the whole process of sort of logical and deductive reasoning, right? Like you can sort of work through something, and you get to a very specific conclusion and a place to go from that. Um, and that can be, that, that's a skill that you can bring to the table, but you are not going to change the way the person thinks that you're interacting with. And you're not going to change the way that they communicate. You can help them potentially come to a different way to solve their problem or think about their problem. But you are not, I just cannot emphasize that enough, you are not going to change their pattern of thinking and communicating, and you shouldn't be trying to. You should be trying to understand what's going on, for sure. You should not necessarily be trying to change uh, the way that people think. So we not only think differently, but we communicate differently. Um, when you grow up in a middle class home, you communicate in what's called a formal register very often. There's a distinction, the easy way to think about it, there's actually five classifications of, of uh, language register going from sort of ultra uh, structure, and you could think of that as like we together recite the Lord's Prayer or something like that, where it's essentially, it's literally scripted. Uh, all the way down into the most sort of intimate and casual um, level of register, which tends to be the language of intimacy, sometimes the language of poetry, that kind of a thing. And between those two extremes, you have, uh, well, we'll just, I'll just boil it down to two, the formal and the casual register. In the formal register, you can sort of think about that as like reading the newspaper. Reading the newspaper communicates, it has a certain realm of words. It's not like reading an academic journal. You know, it's a limitation. I think the average newspaper is written like an eighth or ninth grade reading level, something like that. So it's the formal register has very specific words. There's rules for how those words are used. Uh, how, not only the words themselves, but the order, the syntax, the structure, the grammar that they're put. There's rules for all of that stuff. Uh, and you operate in that. And anybody who grows up in a family that reads at all totally understands the formal register because you read and your parents read, and they read to you, and that's just the way that you communicate. But most of us don't actually interact with each other in the formal register. I'm not even speaking to you tonight in the formal register for the most part. Um, in fact, I've started having this guy work on transcripts from my speaking, and he has a really hard time doing it because I don't speak in a, in a formal register, and that's the way that he was taught English. I speak in a casual register. That means I twist the use of words. That means I use them because we can joke about them whether it's over sports teams or you know what we call one section of the city or whatever. It could be just about anything or how we refer to food or you know, I could I could I could call one of my kids pumpkin and you would figure out pretty quickly that I wasn't talking about a vegetable, right? It just we can use casual register very easy and we can move in and out of that. 
casual register is a much lower number of words. Formal register is a very wide number of words. Casual register can be well under a thousand words. Formal register is tens of thousands of words. So we interact, and you and I, if you've grown up in a, in a, in a middle class home, have a meaningful impact. You're going to have to change the way that you communicate. So all of those kind of things don't come fast. And they're all based on this distinction in terms of how we uh, communicate with each other. From a value standpoint, so, so we, we, uh, we think differently in this linear versus casual thing. We communicate differently in terms of the actual words that we use and our ability uh, to go up and down. Uh, you and I can go up and down. If you're born into poverty, generally speaking, you cannot go up. Um, and then we, uh, we tend to value things differently. Our, our sense of value uh, along economic lines tends to be very different. And the, the most sort of summary way that you could say it is this. In, in the neighborhood, um, and in poor communities, relationships are valued over structure and programs. So just to illustrate that, we run this missions program where students come in from out of town. and The bigger the church, the more heavily programmed the group is that comes in. And they come in with matching t-shirts and they show up on time and they have a summer program for youth that's got some incredibly creative name and every game has a place and teaches you a Bible verse and like on and on and on, right? Like, like it is just, they've got like a rule book for the summer, you know, VBS that they bring with. And, um, and one of the hardest things for us to convince uh, traditional suburbanites about coming into the city is that our kids could not care less if your program starts on time uh, or if it stops on time or if the game goes well or if the rules are followed none of that matters none of that matters if you don't know their name if you know a kid's name and you sit down and you figure out something to laugh about with them and you poke them in the ribs and you know you, you, you spend genuine time with the person it's always, always, always valued over the program. But the way that, that, for those of us who have grown up in a more affluent setting, is that the program is actually the real deal. So it's a crime if church doesn't get out on time. I've been a part of a black church for the past uh, five years. We just left about a year ago to plant a little church. But um, at Christ Bible Church, some of you may hear Pastor Ford on movie radio sometimes, who's my pastor for five years. And they have two services. There's one at, at 8 and there's one at 11. And the 8 o'clock service absolutely has to stop at 10.30 because there's like Sunday school and other stuff. But the 11 o'clock service does not have to stop. <laughs> it's period. So we've been there for an hour and a half, which would be a really short service. And we've been there for three and a half hours. And you just don't know when it's going to stop. And that's completely normal in the neighborhood. Um, and those kind of things are totally, totally normal. Because they're, at the end of the day, the relationships are very, very important. You know, and, and it is common in a black church to literally spend all day at church. You know, you have a service, and then you have a potluck, and then you go back and have another service. And then maybe you have a prayer service after that. I mean, it's just not, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a different sort of value on time. And, and at the end of the day, it's a value of relationships over time. And those kind of things are super common in low-income neighborhoods. I see them again and again and again um, in different places that, that we go. Uh, my wife grew up in Africa um, as a missionary kid. And um, you know, those kind of communication patterns are extremely common there as well. You know, you, you get on the boat, and the African is going to paddle you to, the, to, the, uh, to your destination. And you say, how far is it? He's like, oh, it's just around the corner. <laughs> and 14 corners and three hours later you ask him the same question he gives you the same answer it's around the corner you know it's an attitude of we'll get there when we get there and um, again it's really not as much a racial issue as a cultural issue related to poverty and it tends to be that people live in the moment much better when they're poor than when they're wealthy um, and, and so th those are just a few sort of high-level things that I think that you'll see that are repeatedly, you'll, you'll see those incredibly commonly in these relationships. So let me just uh, uh, shift a little bit and, and, um, and suggest for how, what does that mean in terms of your interaction? And um, what I want to suggest is that 
means thinking about um, a presence in someone's life uh, for mutual benefit. Um, that you're that recognizing your presence in the family's life, that your presence in the child's life over time is what's incredibly important. What's not important because it's not really possible um, is fixing people. And you and I are fixers. We're really good fixers. When when I when the other thing that happens when you know middle class or wealthy people come into my neighborhood, they're like, "Whoa, what happened there? We could totally fix that." <laughs> right? That building is falling down. We could we we could fix that. And the youth groups are the same way. They're like, oh, there's no good playground. We could fix that. We could build a playground. And they're right. They could build a playground. And people could raise the money and fix a building, uh, or they could do something like that, right? That was kind of the response of this couple that I referred to earlier about coming into a home that had no furniture. We could totally fix this. And we and it, and it feels really good to fix stuff. It's a, we bought a 100-year-old abandoned building, and we've fixed it. That, that's been a big part of my job for the past eight years. We just bought another one. Because I liked fixing the first one, so why not fix another one, right? So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you're fixers. I'm saying we are fixers, and there's a place for that. But the problem is when that comes to our attitude in terms of how we interact with the kids and especially the mothers, you are just not going to fix it. It's just too big. There's a passage in in Luke chapter six where Jesus says, um, "Give to everyone who begs from you." which when I lived in the suburbs did not bother me. But that's a troublesome verse when you live where I live. And there's a lot there, a whole lesson that I could teach you, which I won't. But I'll just say this. Um, I don't think that there's any way Jesus could have said that if what he meant is give in such a way that you fix people in their situation, right? Like, you can't do it. There's no way... Actually, there's no way you could give to one person and fix everything. So let alone the idea that you're going to give to whoever begs from you, if you decide to take that passage literally, financially, or time-wise, or whatever. Like, if you literally, there's no possible way what Jesus meant was you're supposed to fix the person's problem. And so I think what he was after was much more the idea that we are simply to be giving people. We are givers. When there are needs in front of us, we respond. We are givers. That's just who we are because God has been so lavish in giving to us, so we give to others. That's what we do at the risk of being taken advantage of, at the risk of not having all the problems, I mean the solutions to all the problems. Our task is not to fix people. It is to be givers and to be gracious and to remain in people's lives. Right? And, to, and so this is about really a faithful presence as God's people in the lives of others that include the poor. And the more relationally intensive it gets, the more meaningful that presence will be, the more insight you'll have. We want to rush to fix people and give answers that probably three years later we'd say, that was the dumbest thing I could have ever done. Why did I do that? Well, it's because we, we often interact out of this rush to fix when it's actually more painful and more costly in some ways to just remain present in the midst of the mess. But in that, there's this huge grace. That's the other part of what I wrote there about mutual benefit. Is that over time, you will recognize, it's hard to see many, many days, but over time, you will recognize that your presence in the lives of people who have great needs will show you the lack of capacity that you have. It will show you your utter need for Jesus Christ. And that is an that's a really amazing gift to receive. It's an amazing, amazing thing to find, you know, to, you know the, the at your end of the rope prayer. Help me, Jesus, because, you know, there's no more rope, right? That's a fantastic place for us as believers to be. And one of the problems with our affluence, really it's a curse, is that we don't actually think we're at the end of our rope because we can produce more rope. We can produce more answers. We can fix more things. And if there's anything these families will give you, it will be a recognition of your incredible need for the grace and the wisdom and the provision of God in your life. So 
So that's a huge, huge benefit, um, and it's painfully learned uh, over time. Um, uh, a couple of just basic quick things that I had mentioned the last time I gave this talk that I think are helpful. So, so one, I think you just need to anticipate the disconnect, right? The not understanding the being, being this, don't like, don't get lost in that when it happens. Just, I mean, or sit in the lostness of it. Like, uh, I don't have any idea what's going on here. That's going to happen. <laughs> that is totally going to happen to you if you get involved. And if you are somebody who's in a support role for someone else who that's happening, that's completely going to happen to them. And you can, and, and you can just recognize that. And you don't have to provide the answer for them necessarily. I don't know that we. You just can't. Right? Like, it's a mess. It's a big mess, and now it just became a bigger mess. I have no idea, right? Yep, that's a mess. That's my answer for you, right? I mean, there's a lot of days, right, Dave, that are like that. That's just, it's just, you know. And then we can slow down and we can think and pray about it. But seeing, anticipating the disconnect, um, is very helpful because then you, then you find yourself saying less often, "I can't," you know, "I can't believe this happened." I can totally believe this happened, right? Like I can, I should, probably should have seen this coming. Bad decision, you know, whatever. Um, uh, my note says preparing host families to listen and to learn as they give, and that's another part of that. It's, it's sort of that we have an opportunity to give of our home, of our food, of our time. What's really important is that that we're doing that in a way that we're listening and we're learning at the same time. Because again, this thing, this you'll find out this really fast, boy, you have a lot to learn. I mean, wow, you have a lot to learn. You could not, most of you could not survive a day in our community living the way many of these families live. Um, the young man that my staff was on the phone with Dave was talking about, you know, just turned 17, living with a woman who claims to have adopted him, who couldn't have adopted him, who's getting a check, um, who pays him a little bit of money to stay someplace else so she can keep the rest of the money. <clears throat> Seven-year-old living at home. Uh, biological parents just got arrested again for dealing drugs and both went to prison for a minimum of a year each. I'm telling you, if you were in his situation today, I don't know if you could survive. I don't know if I could survive. Where do you live? Where do you sleep? How do you feed yourself? How do you go to school the next day? How do you, like, there's a whole set of things that are going to take time for you to understand. And these parents, while they will not tell you this in a linear fashion, <laughs> so they won't start with story one that you'd like to know first. They'll start with story 14, and maybe you'll get the others at some other point. Um, they know a lot uh, about surviving in these contexts. And so listening and learning is incredibly important. Um, I think encouraging healthy sharing as you develop these relationships, you, you want to encourage sharing, but you want to do so carefully. You are often entrusted with very personal stories. And different parents will respond very differently. Some parents will put what seems wildly inappropriate information out, right? Out in the open in front of you and other people, and like it'll shock you when it happens. Like, wow, I can't believe you just said that, you know? But you just put it out there, didn't you? But if, but if they don't want to put it out, you want to be really careful about how you're uh, interacting with the moms and what you're saying. Ask, ask questions. Um, I think questions are good, um, but you, know, you need to read uh, the people that you're talking with so that when you cross, begin to cross lines, you can begin to recognize that. And then the flip side of that is that uh, invariably, if you've had some crazy interaction with a mom, you need to come back and tell somebody that you had this crazy interaction with a mom, you know, or situation, and you're like um, processing this experience that you just had. And I just want to encourage you to think when you're sharing that experience, what if mom was in the room with you while you're telling that story? And just be careful about how you retell that story. Um, especially when it begins to get sort of judgmental along the lines of, the lines of race uh, or class. Just be really, really careful with that. Because um, uh, it's easy, um, I, I'll just say that the, the way that I learned to tell the history of my neighborhood was with my African American friends sitting in the room listening to me tell the story of their neighborhood. And it made me hear myself differently and tell those stories more carefully. And to recognize that you can, when you have a real messy situation, 
you can tell that story very easily in a way that undermines everybody's dignity. And then you can also tell that same story in a way that does not inherently undermine people's dignity. And so just thinking about how you're sharing with each other. Um, and there's all these rules that you'll break and things that, you know, can I use this word? Do I use that word? It's, those are all natural parts of the process. And so I can't tell you exactly what to say or not to say. I'm just saying have this value principle for yourself that you want to encourage healthy stories. Um, uh, uh, two more quick ones. One is, I, I really think that there's a value in looking for intermediaries. Um, what I mean that by that is that if you're um, if you're on this end of the spectrum and you're a uh, middle class uh, suburban white mom who's never driven into the neighborhood and not sure that you would, and way over here is mom that you've met, um, right, bio mom. Um, what, what happens is that when you begin to get involved with her, you sort of move this way. And it has all of these weird ramifications in terms of your value system, in terms of how you communicate. It'll actually impact your political thoughts about some things. It'll, like, it'll just, you'll move a certain degree. And you'll recognize it because um, your friend, who's another middle class suburban white bio mom, you go back and talk to her and she'll look at you and go like, huh? You did what and went where and talked to who? And you're like, actually, I'm pretty comfortable with this, right? Like, like you've moved in the process. And on this spectrum, um, so I'm probably in the middle here someplace. I mean, I live in the neighborhood, so I don't know. Maybe in some ways I'm over there. But my value system is comes steeped right out of suburbs. There was one black kid in my high school. I met my first black person in 10th grade. You know, so I mean, I, like, I did not grow up in the city. Um, but what happens is that recognizing that there's this spectrum and that you sort of move this way and that way, it can be easy to be here and all of a sudden one day, because you had a great relationship or a talk with a mom, to assume that you're actually here now in terms of your understanding. Usually that's not the case. <laughs> Usually, even if it feels great, um, and so what happens is that it's, what, what can be very, very beneficial is to recognize that there are people in intermediary roles, and it could be somebody like myself, it might just be somebody who's been plugged in longer than you have. It's say family, somebody who's been doing this five years, I would think of as being sort of an intermediary person. And having those kind of people in your lives that you can process information with, Dave is an intermediary guy for me with DCFS. Because we, as much as we do what we do, I don't have a lot of direct knowledge about DCFS, so I'm always thinking, who would understand me, but be closer to them, so that I could ask them, I could ask Dave questions about DCFS, which seems to be on another planet for me sometimes, but, he, but he's closer, but he understands me, Do you, you know, follow what I'm saying? So I think looking for those relationships and identifying them are very, very important, because then when you have difficult situations, you, you are thinking about having someone that you can process something very specifically with. Um, I've had many of these conversations um, and to be honest, I, I, from me to Biomo, I have intermediaries too, of different sorts. An African-American mom who's very stable, who's grown up in the neighborhood, who understands the culture much better than I do, but you know, I have some experience, I said, okay, I saw this today, help me understand that. So the idea of intermediaries, I think, is a very important thing, and you can intentionally develop those. And then, this sounds scary, but along that way, your values will change, um, and, and it will happen your values and, and it has sometimes scary consequence. I don't mean that to f scare you. I'm just saying um, when you have one experience with the healthcare system for your whole life and then you get involved with a bio mom and see what the healthcare experience in her community is, it changes how you think about the provision of healthcare. It just does. It doesn't mean you have some wildly different political stance. It just changed like how you understand that whole conversation. The same thing happens with education. Um, the same thing can happen even with your faith. What does it look like for your faith to be lived out? When you see a mom who's only got two dollars in the world give one away, it changes your understanding about what sacrificial giving is. So there's lots of different ways that this path can change you in terms of how you understand what you value. And I, I actually think there's a lot of gifts buried in that, hidden treasure for us um, as we go down that. I know I went a little bit longer than I was supposed to. Um, so let me just stop, and do we still have a little bit of time yeah. for oh, Q&A? Yeah, 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 so yeah. I'd be happy to talk yeah, about whatever you'd like to talk about. Time. So I know I have a bunch of questions, but I want to dominate. <laughs> um, so let me get it going. So, so um, Joe, can you talk about uh, possessions and things a little bit more? 
about how we might relate to things versus how they might relate. And in the past, I heard you talk about the whole gym sheet kind of mentality and why that occurs yeah. like that. And can you talk a little bit? Sure. I really liked your point that our values aren't necessarily the right values. Right. That our beliefs aren't, and we always think that maybe are linear and some of our, you know, we're right and they're wrong. Right. But I've heard you say, we're not necessarily right. Yeah. And there might be some things that are part of our values and system that are actually wrong. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's true. I have been very challenged um, in terms of thinking about um, things like what it means to be wealthy uh, and, and how we value our stuff. Um, say this carefully. I, um, we are in Park Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we had uh, we had family friends invite us. Um, year, this was years ago. Invited my wife to uh, stay at their extra home, which was really great. It was really nice. It was a cabin, and uh, you know we had four small children at the time, and, and um, my wife did everything she could to like. You know, I think they met, they obviously messed up a couple things. I think broke a couple dishes or something like that. But she like meticulously spent like an hour and a half cleaning this home before we, we left. And um, uh, she left. I wasn't there. It was her and the kids. Um, and we got this scathing phone call later about how we had left stuff out of order. We obviously didn't care about anything. Um, it was it was really like mind blowing. Um, that someone's extra home, but had been not treated like, uh, like we weren't the maid at the hotel room that puts the Four Seasons hotel room back the way it was before you stayed there. Like, I mean, that was the, that that was how it felt to us. That that it was clear that those that those extra sets of possessions were so more much more valuable than our family was, and it was really really hurtful. I can't fathom a conversation like that with someone from. Um, the, the, the relationships are what's valuable. And if something gets broken or something uh, gets beat up, I'm not saying there's not going to be a scene about it, but it's not going to define the relationship. The relationships at the end of the day are valued. And so, you know, a single mom who's living in a one bedroom apartment and her, her sister and her two kids get kicked out, she's moving in every time. I mean, she's moving in every time. There's going to be five or ten people in the home, and then they're going to figure out what to do about it. And I'm not saying that's always the healthiest thing. I'm not making that argument. I'm just saying it, it operates under a different value system. Um, I had a, another conversation with another guy who has a, it's funny, just recently, has a beautiful lake home. And somebody just has to borrow it, you know. And it's, it's used about 12 weekends out of the whole year. It's a beautiful place. And he was just totally perplexed on whether or not he should let this other person use his home. And, now that's an extreme. But, it, but to me, it does illustrate this, that the more stuff that we have, the more that we tend to value it. So I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's loaded with spiritual implication for us. And it's why, you know, Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go pass through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Because we, our stuff makes us think that we are capable, uh, that, we, that, that it's about us, that we're good, that we're able, able in, the, in, in really the way that only God is able. God is able. You and I are not able, period. You're not able to take your next breath unless the God who is able gives you that breath, right? We don't think that way. When you tend to be poor, you tend to think that way. Now, there's another part of that, however, that's very, very interesting. Um, and that is that, um, this is specifically along the lines of race. Um, when when uh, you meet someone in America, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity or racial background, um, or economic background, when you meet an African American person in America, you assume they're poor until they prove to you otherwise. So in other words, if you're a if you're a poor black person and you meet a wealthy black person, the first thing you assume about them is they're poor until they prove to you otherwise. It's just the sociological data bears it out. When you meet a white person, again regardless of what your background is, you make an assumption that they're middle class. You all assumed, me being here, that I'm middle class. And until I prove to you otherwise, that's what your assumption will be. I could have shown up in raggedy jeans and a you know bear's cap that's all shredded on the top, and you would have made the same assumption that I am middle class. 
until I prove to you somehow otherwise. And that racial dynamic about presumption, about when you meet someone, factors into um, um, the way that uh, African Americans purchase things. And so there's this thing called conspicuous consumption that is way, it's astronomically more prevalent in the, American, in the African American community across the economic strata. So in other words, poor African Americans buy expensive shoes and hats and cars. We employed these kids all summer and two of our kids, <laughs> they got paid all summer and, and one of the, these teenagers, one went out and spent $300 on a belt and one spent 400 on a belt. And boy, my Sarah, who talked to you 